All right, good evening, saints. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord in Bible study. So we want to keep moving along in our series on the names of God. And we can go ahead and go to the first slide, which again is just a bit of a summary for what we've had. We can go to, there we go. So we know that the God we serve, we have one God, but that sometimes God is referred to in this generic sense of El. Israel calls God Elohim. And as you all know, somebody tell me something about Elohim, because y'all know this now. Hmm? It's plural. Who said that? Okay, next time, shout it out. Okay, Zipporah. So it's plural. There's something in the name of God, that, that generic name of God that Israel uses, that connotes that God has all of the things that are needed by God's people. All of the other nations have pantheons. They have many gods, a god for every need. But the God of Israel, one God, has everything that's needed. Adon is a word for Lord, Adonai, my Lord. And then we talked a little bit about God's personal name. Those four letters are what we call the Tetragrammaton, four letters. And that is the name, God's personal name, that was revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai that can mean I am that I am, I am becoming what I am, I am what I am becoming. Um, the sense that all that God is, is moving forward, constantly revealing. And the good news is, that means that whatever we need in a given moment, God's got it. The exciting part is that we will never completely know all that there is to know about God. That means that sometimes our difficult moments are opportunities to learn something about God we never knew before. And so we will see that the prefixes to these different names for God come in two forms. So we'll often get El something, like El Shaddai. Um, and then the other thing that we'll see in the Bible would be the Tetragrammaton plus another name that's a descriptor. Israel would never try to pronounce God's personal name out of respect. And so we talked about the word Jehovah, which is a hybrid word, but we're going to use it because it works just fine. All right? So we're going to try tonight to get through four different names for God. So let's see if we can, we can do this. I know that um, last week um, you all had a really good study with Pastor on um, Jehovah Shalom. And so tonight we're going to start with a Jehovah name, and we're going to turn to the 23rd Psalm, which is something, a text I'm sure you are, many of you are very, very familiar with. Okay, can someone who wants to come stand at the mic come and read Psalm 23, verse 1, or better yet, just recite it? I'll take it either way. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. All right, there it is. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that's a verse that many of us know very well. Here's the trick. The first two words in Psalm 23 are simply this. So we go this way, which would be... God's personal name. Don't stay with me, people. So now, remember that Hebrew goes right to left. We go left to right. So essentially, the first word is Jehovah Shepherd. Okay? Except that's not quite right. It's actually Jehovah, my shepherd. We supply the verb to be. 
So it is what we call a nominal sentence. There, are, there is in the Hebrew language a sentence sometimes that does not have the verb to be. It will have the subject and then it will have the word that modifies the subject. So here's the subject, Jehovah, and what modifies it? My shepherd. And so when we encounter a sentence like that, we supply the verb is. The Lord is my shepherd. But we can also look at this and see it as a name, Yahweh shepherd. Now, we love the 23rd Psalm, and there are more books on the 23rd Psalm than I care to imagine. Everybody likes to write about the 23rd Psalm. A shepherd looks at the 23rd Psalm. Pretty soon there's going to be a book called A Sheep Looks at the 23rd Psalm. <laughs> so we have all these books about this beautiful image of God as our shepherd, pastoring us, taking care of us, supplying all of our needs, leading us through the valley of the shadow of death. It is a psalm of what I call orientation because we teach it to children to remind them the nature of God's caring for us. But it is also a psalm of reorientation because in times of grief and suffering, it reorients us by reminding us about God's constant and caring presence. So we love all of those elements in this psalm about the Lord. But what's intriguing to me about this is that unlike many of the names for God, it has the qualifier of my. There's a personal element here. Not Yahweh shepherd, like God of peace or God provides. God is my shepherd. And so with this name, we are introduced to the personal element that means God can, can, is concerned about me. There might be a whole flock of sheep, but he knows my name. And I belong to him. So there's this sense of being identified as belonging to God within a community. The other thing I want to point out about this psalm is that we love this image of shepherd, but in the ancient world, shepherd would have been a term that would have also described a king. So now stay with me for a minute. What if we were to read Psalm 23, Jehovah is my king? All right. When Israel talks about their monarchs or their kings, they often refer to them as shepherd, which is why it's more than an interesting convenience that King David was originally a shepherd. It's a way, it's like typecasting. When we look at David as a shepherd, he is developing the qualities that he will need to lead the people. All right. So that when we talk about Yahweh as shepherd, we're also saying God is our king. God is sovereign and God reigns. And so we want to remember that this name then of Yahweh as shepherd also carries with it the connotation of Yahweh as king, which is more than gentle leader. It is the one who reigns and rules. Okay? So that these are two very different kinds of authority. And when we read this psalm, that means that we can read it on at least two levels. Now, this is always true of scripture. If you're good at it and you dig deep, you should be surprised by something you didn't see the first time. And sometimes the way to see more than one level is by exploring one word. And in this case, it's right up front, shepherd. So we can read it as God gently leading us and taking care of us in this pastoral scene with grass and brooks and all that lovely stuff, we can also read it as God who is our king, who reigns and rules and provides and protects. Okay? Any questions about this one? Okay, can I give you a couple of references to, to um, look at to think of Yahweh as king? So one is 1 Samuel 12.12. 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12. And keep your finger in Psalms if you haven't, if, you, if it's not too late. If it's too late, don't worry about it. 1 Samuel 12, 12. This is Samuel. When you saw that King Nahash of the Ammonites came against me, against you. You said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us, though, and here we have the word for God's personal name, though Jehovah 
your God was your king. Okay? So in this context, Samuel is reminding the people of Israel that they wanted a king. But the reason God was reluctant to give them a king is because God said, I'm your king. I'm all you need. And fast forward a couple of generations, and Israel realized we should have just stuck with the Lord. It was a better deal. All right? Psalms. Let's go to the Psalms and just look at a couple of these really quickly. Psalms 10, 16. And there again, you see the Lord, all capital letters. When you see L-O-R-D, all caps, that's the reminder that we're looking at God's personal name. Oh, the Lord is king forever and ever. The nation shall perish from his land. Psalm 47, 2. Psalm 47, 2. This is a nice psalm. Okay. For the Lord, again, that's God's personal name, the Most High is awesome, a great king over all the earth. Israel wants to assert God's presence as king because in the known world, that's as good as it gets for human beings. That's as high as the power gets. And so we use this image of God as king to say, not only is our God king, our God is king over all of y'all other people's gods and all of y'all other people's kings. God our God reigns supreme. Now take that image of rulership and supremacy and put it in the word shepherd. This sovereign God cares for, feeds me, provides for me. It's all in that one word. And if you want to find more references for God as king, just you know, open the Psalm, book of Psalms and throw a, throw a rock. You'll hit one. All right? <laughs> So there are a lot of them. All right, so if it's all right with you, we're going to move on to the next name. Are we good? All right, let's go to the next slide. Ah, it's a great one. All right, Elkanah. All right, Elkanah. Now, there are two references, if we have time, that we want to look at here. And the first one is in the book of Exodus. Chapter 20. Okay. So, the book of Exodus is giving us the account of God redeeming the Israelites out of slavery and the deal was that they were supposed to go to the promised land, but that's not where they go immediately. Um, they spend 40 years in the wilderness, and it's in the wilderness on Mount Sinai that they receive a lot of law. And some of the law they receive comes in the form of the Ten Commandments, which begins in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Then God spoke all these words. I am, do you see that L-O-R-D? It's God's name. I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, Adonai, your God, am El Elkanah. I am a jealous God punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generations of those who reject me. Keep reading, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, so here we have these 10 words or 10 commandments that God gives to Israel. And the first ones have to do with the supremacy of God. I am the Lord your God, brought you out of the land of you out of the house of bondage, you shall have no other gods before me. The commandment acknowledges the presence of other gods. God's like, I'm not here to argue about whether other people have other gods. You can't have any other gods. All right? That's, so we spend all this time trying to talk about which god is real and which god. God's like, I, we're not talking about that. You 
are mine, all right, exclusively, all right? And so that's the first thing. You shall have no other gods before me. And this word before me can be, it is um, all, so it could mean beside me, because Israel liked to try to sneak that in a little bit. Like, we worship the Lord God of Israel, but we also like a little Asherah worship on the side. Or, you know, every Tuesday, every Wednesday, we sneak over here and do a little something over here. No other God in front of me, no other God beside me, no other gods. All right? That's the first part. But then the second part of that has to do with another thing that's related to this, and that is the worshiping of idols. This sense of putting a form on God so that an idol, if you will, accentuated an aspect of the deity. So if you look at an idol, it should tell you what the God did, essentially. So what then would be the dilemma in making an idol of the God of Israel? You have to come to the mark. Now nobody wants to say anything. Come on, y'all, it's your Tuesday night exercise. Come on, we can do it. What is the dilemma in creating an idol for this God? Oh, I see a brave soul, come on. Uh, the problem with doing that is that he's Elohim, he's plural, he's everything that you need. So uh, boxing, it, boxing God into one aspect is limiting God's, uh, uh, God in your life or God's revelation to you. Well done. And thank you for coming to the mic. There's a there we go. Now that's an example for the rest of y'all. Walk to the mic. Um, absolutely, that's the exact problem. If we make an image of God, what would the image be? And the image would most likely be more a reflection of us or our desire for what we want God to be than what God truly is. And what I love about this commandment is that most of us think we don't do this because we don't have carved idols, but I want to um, suggest that we do uh, commit the sin of idolatry when we limit who God is. And we decide where God goes and where God doesn't go and who God works with and who God doesn't work with and which denominations are especially in favor in the eyes of God. All right, that's all idolatry. We don't get to choose what God looks like in any given moment, all right? That goes back to that name, I am what I am, stay out of my way. I am becoming what I am becoming, let me be God, all right? So that's the issue of idolatry. And then in all of this, God says, why? For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. This is a human emotion that we usually don't think of attributing to a holy and righteous God. So what do we do with the fact that God describes God's self as jealous? I can't hear what you said because you didn't come to the mind. <laughs> what do we want to do with this? I got all night. <laughs> okay. God describes God's self as jealous, which is an attribute that we usually do not think of as a positive thing. Yes? And here it is being used to describe God. That seems a little problematic. Why is that? What do we want to make of that? What's happening with that description of God? What is it trying to convey to us about God? Come on, Zipporah. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's good. You know, because sometimes we use uh, human attributes to describe God. The good part about that is the reality is you can't understand what is not like you until you can connect it to something that is like you. So we appropriate what is unknown by what is known, right? You're trying to explain a new concept to somebody. You say, well, it's like, 
And the thing that comes after that is something that they're familiar with. And you use that as a bridge to introduce this new concept. So we know that jealousy means I don't like it when you are over here and I want you over here. I don't like it when you spend time with this person because I want you to myself. And so in some ways, it helps us to understand God doesn't like us worshiping other gods. Is there anything else we can take from this? We don't have an open quote relationship. <laughs> you know, I can't go out and talk to Buddha. Buddha's not providing for me. You know, it's God. So he's going to be jealous. You know, I'm yours and you're mine. And that's yes. the bottom line. Yes. I love the word you used, relationship. Because so often when we look at legal material and we talk about covenant, we think of it as simply a legal contract. But this is a relationship. And the introduction of the term jealous brings it into a level of the messiness of human relationship that most of us understand. All right, most of us have felt jealous at some point in time. Um, and the feeling of jealousy suggests that the thing or the person you feel jealous about is of value to you. That means that we are of value to God, so much so that God feels something or has a response when we step outside of the safe space of the exclusive relationship, all right? So for all of the negative connotations, there's this positive piece about the fact that it means we are of significance, we matter to God. God is not saying, y'all go act up if you want to, I'll go make another race tomorrow. Because, well, think about it. Could not God do that? And then y'all know when y'all were dating, that's what some of y'all said. Walk out this door if you want to. I'll find somebody who looks just like you next week and will not look back, right? That's not what God is saying. God is saying, no, it matters to me if you leave. It matters to me if you step outside the bounds of this relationship. Okay? Come to the mic. Mm hmm Another thing came to my mind, and that is that God has the responsibility to us, and we, in turn, should have a responsibility yes. to him. Yes, that is what this whole covenant thing is about. When God says, I will be your God and you will be my people, God has an obligation, we have an obligation. Yeah, it goes both ways. And you know, and it's, which is a beautiful thing. The downside of that, of course, is that God is in a relationship with someone who is incapable of being faithful. No, think about it. That, so that the challenge is that, I don't know how else to say it. It's, a, well, that's, this is, it's true, right? This is who we are, that God is in this committed relationship with, with a people who just, even when we're doing our best, we just can't sustain it for long periods of time, right? So that's the tension. Now, hold on to that. We'll come back to that. Now, can I show you a really, another story really quick that's really cool about Elkanah? This is one of my favorite things in the Bible. No, really, really. First Samuel chapter 1. Okay, so... You know, y'all know I love, you know I love the Bible. You know I love studying the Bible. Sometimes studying the Bible when I'm doing it for work is, is hard. I mean, it's drudgery. You're just digging and digging and digging and you're not finding anything. But this is one of these great moments, okay? So, no, really, I love this thing. Okay, so, um, okay. There was a man, just 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man of Ramathiam, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was... What's his name? Elkanah. Sounds like? Ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Now wait, why does this matter? Because who knows the story of Elkanah? Elkanah has a wife named Penina and a wife named Hannah. And Penina has children and Hannah doesn't, right? 
And so Penina is jealous, and I don't, I mean, Hannah's jealous. I don't blame her. She's upset because she lives in a world where women have status based on the number of sons they have. She's got nothing, all right? And it's apart from her own desire, perhaps, to have a child, that this loss of status, women didn't have a whole lot of options in this world. Um, and so you want to feel for her. And here's the part. So she's so upset. Um, verse seven. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she, that's Penina, used to provoke her, Hannah. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than 10 sons? Okay, so Elkanah loves Hannah even though she doesn't have children. Understand that they live in a world where Elkanah would have a legal right to put her away because she doesn't have children. He doesn't put her away. He, not, he, he loves her. All right, it's not like he's keeping her out of pity. He loves her. Hannah, on the other hand, cannot get to the point where she can't eat because she doesn't have a child. And Elkanah says, why are you sad? Am I not more to you than 10 sons? What does Hannah say? Nothing. <laughs> she doesn't answer him. Okay? And this is a powerful moment because, all right, so I'm going to have to give you the short version. Okay, so you know the story. So uh, she goes to the Lord, and she prays, and she prays, and the priest comes out, and he sees her lips moving, but there's no sound coming out of her mouth. And so he thinks she's drunk, and she chastises him, her, and she says, no, 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 I'm really sad. And he says, may the Lord grant you this thing that you have asked. And she goes home, and she's no longer sad, and eventually she gets pregnant, has a child, and his name is Samuel. And uh, she says, um, she names him Samuel because I asked him of God. All right, so here's the, the, the brief version. Now, you've got to read this because it's a great chapter. There's a, there's a problem with the story. She says, I named him Samuel because I asked him of God, except that's not what Samuel means. Samuel doesn't mean I asked him of God. Do you know what means I asked? Sha'al or Sha'ul or Saul. I know. Wait, hang on. This is really exciting. I promise. So here's the thing. So the story of the birth of Samuel, okay? You know the story. It's a good story. It's a real story. It's legit, all right? But the story of the birth of Samuel functions as an allegory for the birth of the monarchy. Come back. Hannah represents Israel, who doesn't have a king. And all the other nations, uh-huh, 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 all the other nations have kings, right? So she's unhappy because she doesn't have what everybody else has. And what does Elkanah say to her? How come I'm not enough? Woo! So do you see how cool that is? Like how it works on two different levels that you have this notion of God saying to Israel what Elkanah says to Hannah, am I not enough? Wow. Hold on, because I think on some level, this is the question that God asks us. How come I'm not enough? Am I not more to you than 10 sons? All right? Remember what I said earlier about God marry. It's God, the, the, the image of God marrying Israel, or God, Christ marrying the church, is by definition a marriage between unequals. Let's just be clear. Ain't nobody in here good enough to be the bride of Christ, right? Let's, like, let's just get that out there just in case someone was deceiving themselves into thinking, you know, I, it could be me. No, not really, right? So none of us could do that. In order to be, for Israel to be God's wife or for the church to be the bride of Christ, there is this sense in which the groom has to step down, Right? Yes, that, that, that would be to meet us, that, yes. And so then to have this groom and to look at this groom and say, that ain't it, that's not enough, 
feel what Elkanah feels in Hannah's silence. Feel what Hannah feels when she lives in a world that tells her her value is over here, when her husband's trying to tell her her worth is over here. So that part of our problem is that we are getting our messages from our worth from sources other than God. So that the source of some of our mess comes from the fact that we're not listening to the person we're supposed to be listening to. Okay? Isn't that cool? I love that chapter. I love it. Okay. All right. All right. We got our, okay, we got to go. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Okay. So now we're going to look at the next slide, which is Adonai Ehad. Okay. And Ehad is an easy word. It simply means one. Okay. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4, 5, and 6, we have what the Jewish community calls the Shema. It begins with the word Shema. It's a command. Hear, O Israel. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. That's your one. Va'ahavta eight Adonai Eloheka, your God. Bechol levavka, uvechol nafshika. So hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord Ehad, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? With all of your soul, your nefesh, with all of your strength, your, um, your force, your, um, it even gets translated your muchness. A couple of things I want to point out. In, and in the New Testament, Jesus refers to this as the great commandment, Right? The great commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, and with all your strength. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Just a little plug for the Old Testament. The first and second commandments both come from the Old Testament, just saying. Okay, now, so what do we want? So the first thing, okay, I was trying to say. The thing we want to point out is that the commandment from God, what God requires of Israel is what? What's the first part of the commandment? Love, not obedience. Love. You shall love the Lord God. Now see, this is why we're not God. Because if I were God, I would say, I don't care whether you like me or not. Just do what I say. All right? You shall obey with all of your heart. God says, love. Love. That if we in fact love, all the other stuff takes care of itself. Yes, if we love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength, God's like, I'm done here. We're good. And if we could, as a community, remember that our job in discipleship is to teach how to love God. We get so worried about the rules, okay? How many inches can my heels be? Can, can we just love God? And eventually the shoes will work themselves out, right? We get distracted. What does it mean to love God? Okay, so what am I trying to get with this? I'm going to get off track here. Um, so here, this sense of God, um, the Lord is um, one. I want to suggest that another way to translate that is, is to say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone alone or only because it resonates with God being a jealous God, God being our king, God being our shepherd, and there being no other. So that the love God wants from us is total and complete, directed to this one God, the only God worthy. Okay? 
And so you can read this and you begin to think, well, why didn't Israel get this? Because it seems to be repeated again and again, right? They didn't get it for the same reason we don't, right? Because we can't. We don't. We just don't. We don't get it. We miss it, okay? Um, so in this great commandment, the idea of loving God with all that we have can be the great commandment because it really does cover everything else. If I love the Lord God with all my heart, with all my mind, and with all my strength, the Ten Commandments are covered. And all those other laws in Exodus, they are covered. If I do that. And might I say that perhaps the way for us as communities of faith to adjudicate unchartered territory, you know, so what am I saying? I'm saying there are things that the Bible doesn't tell us what to do. Areas where the Bible does not give a commandment, okay? And so there are lots of ways of approaching what it means to be godly in a situation where I don't have a scripture verse that I can go to that says, and on Tuesday you should not go to Whole Foods because it is an abomination, okay? So if I don't know what to do, how about if I start with loving the Lord God with all my heart and with all my mind and with all my strength? Is this somehow this thing I'm thinking about would it be a reflection of that? Would it be in accordance with that? Okay? Okay. Um, any questions? I feel like I'm talking a lot here. Any questions? Okay, we've got time for one more. Okay, this is a good one too. Okay, that is... Yahweh or Jehovah. We can go to the last slide. Oh, there's probably an H on the end of it, but I can't fit it on there, so um, you can look on the screen. So for Jehovah Shama, we're going to go to the book of Ezekiel. Okay, so I got to tell you a little bit about Ezekiel. There are three major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Jeremiah, oh, not Jeremiah, Ezekiel is unique from the other two major prophets in that if you read Isaiah and you read Jeremiah, you can almost hear the prophet speaking. It's an oral text. Ezekiel is a written text, which means it is very wordy. Ezekiel has a lot to say. Ezekiel is also unique in that in the beginning of Ezekiel, he does something that you're not supposed to do which is try to, to give a visual description of God. And essentially what Ezekiel is describing is the foundation of the throne upon which God sits. And it's in the beginning of the book of Ezekiel. Hmm? Okay, okay, it's the last verse. Whatever the last verse is, uh, 35, yeah. Yeah, verse 36 is only in the Bibles of people who are really saved. So. <laughs> If you don't have it, I don't know what to tell you. All right, just stay here and pray a little longer. So anyway, Ezekiel in the beginning has this elaborate description of the foundation of the throne of God. And this is where we get that song, Ezekiel saw the wheel in the middle of the wheel, way up in the middle of the air. It's a very elaborate description, but very hard to understand. It is very much otherworldly. What I want you to understand is that Ezekiel's vision in chapter 1 represents what we call Jerusalemite theology or Zion theology. So, nowadays in the year 2013, there are, um, I don't know how many people in the world consider themselves Christians, but however many there are, we would all agree that we don't all believe the same things about everything right? We have differences in doctrine. Some of us think baptism should happen this way. Some of us think baptism should happen that way. We also have differences in theology. We have differences in, so one of the, a good example would be um, some people believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. And other people say, keep acting up and see what happens, right? So that one of the differences within the Christian community is, is salvation eternal or is it conditional? 
That example of once saved, always saved, or conditional, you know, if you backslide far enough, you're going to slide right out of the kingdom kind of thing. So th th that's an example that's good because in Israel, we see amongst the prophets two different theological positions, okay? Prophet Jeremiah, he was on the backslide side. Jeremiah said, keep acting up and you will no longer be God's people, all right? Isaiah and Ezekiel were on the once saved, always saved side that said, you are God's people and that's just the way it is, all right? And you should act right because you're God's people, all right? Now, that meant that the people on Isaiah and Ezekiel's side had, a, had to have a theological, a different theological response when the kingdom of Israel was destroyed. All right? So when Jeremiah, if you're on Jeremiah's side and Judah gets destroyed, Jeremiah can say, see, I told you. Just like I said, y'all sin, here's the punishment, deal with it. All right? That's Jeremiah. And the Jeremiah had other problems, but his theology wasn't one of them. Now, Isaiah and Ezekiel had to deal theologically with the fact that the temple was destroyed. And the way that Ezekiel deals with it is magnificent because he starts his prophetic text by talking about the presence of the glory of God. And the belief on this theological side was that the reason Jerusalem couldn't be destroyed was because the temple was there. And in the temple was the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant was God's very presence. Can't nobody come in here if God is here. And so the security that supported that theological position had to do with the fact that God's presence would be stronger than any force that came. When the temple was destroyed, people who had this theological position had a crisis that they had to deal with. And the way that Ezekiel deals with the crisis is that in Ezekiel chapter 10, he has a vision. Turn to chapter 10. And in Ezekiel chapter 10, he gives a vision of the glory of God leaving. God's presence leaves because God can no longer tolerate the people's sin. Um, let's see. Look in verse, we'll start with verse 1. Then I looked, and above the dome that was over the heads of the cherubim, there appeared above them something like a sapphire, in form resembling a throne. He said to the man clothed in linen, Go within the wheelwork underneath the cherubim. Fill your hands with burning coals from among the cherubim. Scatter them over the city. He went in as I looked on. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the house when the man went in, and a cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord rose up from the cherub to the threshold of the house. The house was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. The sound of the wings of the cherubim was, as, was heard as far as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty, El Shaddai, when he speaks. When he commanded the man clothed in linen, take fire from within the wheelwork, from among the cherubim. He went in and stood beside a wheel, and a cherub stretched out his hand from among the cherubim to the fire that was among the cherubim, took some of it, and put it into the hands of the man clothed in linen, and who took it and went out. The cherubim appeared to have the form of a human hand under their wings. I looked, and there were four wheels beside the cherubim, one beside each cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was like gleaming barrel. This goes back to the description you see in chapter one. And as for their appearance, the four looked alike, something like a wheel within a wheel. When they moved, they moved in any of the four directions without veering as they moved. But in whatever direction the front wheel faced, the others followed without veering as they moved. Don't ask me what that means, I don't know. Their entire body, their rims, their spokes, their wings, all the wheels, the wheels of the four of them were full of eyes all around. As for the wheels, they were called in my hearing the wheel work. Each one had four faces. The first face was that of the cherub. The second face was that of a human being. The third, that of a lion. The fourth, that of an eagle. The cherubim rose. Those, these were living creatures that I saw by the river Chabar. 
When the cherubim moved, the wheels moved beside them, and when the cherubim lifted up their wings to rise up from the earth, the wheels at their side did not veer. When they stopped, the others stopped. When they rose up, the others rose up with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in them. This is all pulling from the imagery and the language we see in chapter 1. Verse 18, Then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house and stopped above the cherubim. The cherubim lifted up their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight as they went out with the wheels beside them. They stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the house of the Lord, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. So here he has a vision uh, that explains in retrospect how it is that the temple could be destroyed, that God's holiness could not tolerate the sin that was in the city, and so God's spirit left. And when God's spirit left, that left the city vulnerable, all right? Now, go back to this whole model or this whole image of God being jealous and God being in relationship with us. Because what we have here is yet another example of a broken covenant, okay? But the beauty of this passage is that the story does not end here that we move to the end of Ezekiel, and after the judgment of God, now we go to the very end, there is, starting in verse 40, a, a series of messages, a series of prophetic oracles that create a picture of what God will restore, or how God will recreate. So there is a new temple that we have in chapter 40. And all of the description of what happens in the temple. Chapter 43, verse 2, And there the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east. The sound was like the sound of mighty waters, and the earth shone with his glory. The vision I saw was like the vision that I had when he came to destroy the city and like the vision I had seen by the river Chabar. And I fell on my face as the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing the east. The spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Okay. Now think about all those praise and worship songs we sing about God's glory in this place. And think about how we are echoing a theme that goes back centuries to rejoice in the actual presence of God, that God is present in this place. Okay, now go to chapter 48 at the end. And here we have the restored city. Now, can we just look for a minute at Ezekiel 48, verse 1? Um, because it begins with, these are the names. There is a book of the Bible that begins with those words. This is Bible trivia. This is a little tricky one. Okay, I'll give you a hint. No, it's, it's in the Old Testament. There might be a book in the New Testament. Um, no, that's not a good hint. Okay, it's, um, it's a book in the Bible. It's in the first five books. What? I heard, say it again. Say it. Yes, it's Exodus. So Exodus begins with these are the names. Why does this matter? Because Exodus is the book that is the, the defining moment of the birth of Israel. So when this last chapter in this piece of restoration for Israel in the book of Ezekiel begins with these are the names, it wants the hearers to know this is rebirth. These are the names, and it gives the names of the tribes. Exodus 1, these are the names of the sons. The sons are the tribes, yes? So we get the names of the tribes, and we get their location. We get all of the description of the city. I'm going to move all the way down to um, verse 30. These shall be the exits of the city 
on the north side, which is to be 4,500 cubits by measure, three gates, the gate of Reuben, the gate of Judah, and the gate of Levi, the gates of the city being named after the tribes of Israel. On the east side, which is to be 4,500 cubits, three gates, the gate of Joseph, the gate of Benjamin, the gate of Dan. On the south side, which is to be 4,500 cubits by measure, three gates, the gate of Simeon, the gate of Issachar, and the gate of Zebulun. On the west side, which is to be 4,500 cubits, three gates, the gate of Gad, the gate of Asher, and the gate of Naphtali. The circumference of the city shall be 18,000 cubits. And here we get the name of the city from that time on shall be Yahweh Shama. Adonai Shama, the Lord is there. No longer Jerusalem, but that the name itself celebrates the presence of God. For people who knew what it was like to experience separation from God because of their sin, in the restored city, the name of the city celebrates the presence of God. God's presence is ongoing and consistent even when we are not. And that is what we celebrate every time we celebrate the presence of God because God is not obligated to show up. By virtue of all of the things we have done time and time and time again to break the covenant, God is not obligated. But God, out of God's mercy, chooses to be present in our lives. And that's why we celebrate. And that's why we rejoice in the presence of God, because God is there. Okay? Okay. All right, that's it for tonight. Are there any questions? Oh, good. Come on. Dr. Judy, can you remind us which translation of the Bible you're reading Uh, from? Yes. Tonight I am using... The New Revised Standard Version. Were there some differences? Like uh, like what? It said the Lord is there? Well, that's what this said too. I just said El Shama, so you would... That wasn't the translation, that was me. I just did that so you would see it. Like, see, there it is. Yeah, it's in the foot, it's in the footnotes. Okay. All right, do you have a question? Come on, we got a minute. Something I hadn't thought about before when you were talking about the two schools of yes. the prophets. Yes. When you were talking about once saved, always saved, yeah. or that, you know, yeah. you keep messing. What was interesting about it to me is that in the one school with Ezekiel, God could leave. I'm, I, I'm challenged by that, that God could leave. I, you know, it's funny, I always felt comfortable thinking that. I could mess around and leave God. <laughs> but I'm, because I mess up. You know, that's yeah. a mistake if you mess, yeah. if you leave God. Yeah. But I was disturbed yeah. thinking God might leave me. Yes. And that's, a, and, and that's the difference, you know. And, right. and, and then I was trying to bring that into the whole thing of once saved, always saved. Yeah. So you're saying that even in that theology of once saved, always saved, there's a possibility that God could leave? Well, God left the temple. Okay. I mean, well, God, left the, I mean God, God left <laughs> the temple. That was interesting to me. I'm I mean, just saying. I mean, clearly God didn't leave the scene completely okay. because, I mean, think about it. If God left the scene, oh, what's the, okay, that's the best example. Oh, this, all right. Stay with me for a second. So there's this, all right, so, <laughs> all right. I don't know if any of y'all saw the movie The Avengers, but Okay, yay. Okay, yeah. So, but the, the alien force comes in, and you know, there are all these bad people. Once you kill the mothership, all the other aliens drop to the ground. Like, you don't have to fight anybody else, because once you kill the central, central nerve, the rest falls apart. If God had really left, think about it. We, we wouldn't be here. So, even when we feel that God is distant, God's not really gone, right? We, our very breath comes from God. So if we're still here, God's somewhere. Um, so that's, that's the difference. But the sense of God, God's, 
Israel being able to experience or, or feel God's imminent presence or God's protection is what is gone. Okay? And God allows that to happen, so Israel will decide, well, maybe I only want to worship one God after all. Right? Okay, it's a kind of, remember what Pastor preached about on Sunday, about that whole notion of um, sometimes the will, God having to do something because we will not necessarily surrender our will. I want to follow up on what Harriet just said. God also left Jesus on the cross. But when, did he really leave? No, he didn't really leave, but God, <laughs> Jesus yeah. certainly thought he did. Why have you forsaken me? Mm-hmm. But he chooses to stay with, anyway, with us anyway. That's his grace and mercy. Yeah. And we yeah. have to yeah. lift him up yeah. because not only of who he is, yeah. because he has such grace and mercy for yeah. us. Yeah. No matter who we are, what yeah. we do, or who we think we are, yeah. what we think we yeah. do. Yeah. He's always there for us. Absolutely. If he can turn his back, if you will, on his only begotten son. Yeah. Yes. He chooses to stay with us. Yeah. And that's the blessing I think that we can go home with. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. I think the challenge of being human is that we will, in our relationship with God, have moments when we feel God is present and moments when we feel, we'll feel God is distant. That's part of what it means to be finite. Um, so um, more about that later. We're, we're out of time. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks once again for the opportunity to study and learn and be challenged by your living word. Lord, we thank you that you are our God and our God alone. And we thank you, Lord, that you are a jealous God, that you care about our heart and about our affections, and that you call us to love you with all of our being. Lord, we ask that you would bless um, all that happened here tonight, Lord, that you would preserve that which is good and anything that is not good, that it would just blow away like chaff, that no one would be drawn into confusion because of anything that was said here tonight. Bless the work of this Bible study, Lord. Bless the work of this church. Bless each person here and each family represented. We ask that everyone will get home safely, Lord. And finally, we give you thanks because you are present. You are here. Thank you, Lord. Amen.